Steele Mahalan, and welcome to Artbeat. Tonight, we dedicate this edition of Artbeat to the memory of William Arthur Smith, who was one of the finest artists from Bucks County. We remember him as an artist, husband, father, teacher, ambassador, patriot, and friend. William Smith did not like to be labeled. He has said that he liked to do all types of things. He liked to do portraits, landscapes, subject paintings, oils, and watercolors. He designed postage stamps, illustrated books, magazines, and manuals. He made prints, painted gigantic murals, and did commemorative coins. Bill Smith was born in Toledo, Ohio in 1918, and he began drawing at an early age. His self-portrait was exhibited in an adult show in Toledo when he was only 13. He studied at Theodore Keene's Art School in Toledo. Keene had been Dean of the Art School at the Chicago Art Institute. At the age of 19, Bill established a studio in New York City where he became a commercial artist. At 21, he was teaching at the Grand Central Art School. He collaborated with Pearl Buck on several children's books for which he did the illustrations. Pearl Buck said when asked about Bill's talent, William Smith can paint China. Not all artists can. Some go and paint pictures about China, seen through their own personalities. But William Smith went into China and gave himself up. He has brought back real Chinese, their figures and their faces true, and he has brought back the landscapes and homes in which they live. The Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, forerunner of today's Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, was established during World War II. Because of Bill's interest in and knowledge of China, General William Donovan, who headed the agency, asked him if he would consent to be recruited into the OSS. Bill said yes. He spent the duration of World War II traveling throughout much of China in territory occupied by our Chinese allies headed by Chiang Kai-shek and often in Japanese-held areas. There he gathered intelligence about the enemy and used art to build Chinese morale and counter Japanese propaganda. Travel was always an important part of Mr. Smith's life. He lectured and taught all over the world, both on his own and as a representative of the U.S. government or international art organizations. He visited and lectured in art schools in the Soviet Union, as well as in Greece. Once, his studio was on an elephant's back in Burma. He was never without a sketchbook. Mr. Smith is listed in Who's Who in America. The list is quite long and quite impressive. Much of what he did centered around his love of art. As he once said, art enlarges the spirit. It is an expression of wonder, of appreciation. William Smith and his wife Farrell settled in a converted Bucks County barn in 1956 where they hosted the great and the near great. Carl Sandburg was a frequent guest there. He read to the Smith children, Rick and Kim, and ate breakfast with their youngest daughter, Kathleen. Bill painted Sandberg's portrait in his home studio. This portrait now hangs in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Smith also designed the Sandberg Centenary Stamp of 1978. Carl Sandberg once said of Bill Smith, when he paints bug, leaf, animal, antique head, or worn house, or fresh child face, his prayer is to be inside of it as part of what gives it personal identity an inviolable dignity. Smith's largest work was a 1,000 square foot mural for the Maryland House on Route 95, 18 miles north of Baltimore. He was commissioned to design several U.S. postage stamps honoring famous Americans and historical events. These four stamps of the Boston Tea Party represent an historical authenticity which Bill always insisted upon. Research and books were artistic tools for him. Bill's versatility and variety of subject matter is evident in his latest works. His paintings of David Burpee, the founder of the famous seed company, and George Nakashima, his good friend, bear tribute to his unique style of portraiture. The late Charles Shaw, who was once the editor of the New Hope Gazette, said of Bill, he is both a spiritual and an earthy man. He has faults enough to endear himself to those who are more flawed. 
William A. Smith was a great artist who believed in excellence and in doing the very best of which one is capable. I asked Farrell to tell us how she and Bill met. Bill was a uh, very precocious, 22 years old teacher of art at the Grand Central School of Art in New York in 1942, 43. Uh, most of the students were probably his age at that time. Anyway, he went into the army shortly thereafter, went and joined the OSS. We didn't meet again until 46, at which time we had a long and rather rocky courtship and weren't married until the end of 49. I went to Paris to live, but to make up for the long courtship, we had a year and a half honeymoon in France. I also spoke with Farrell about what it was like being married to an artist. I think I probably had an easier time of it because uh, having been uh, certain, certainly having the background of art that I had myself, uh, uh, it was easier to understand uh, a lot of the problems that a, an artist in the visual arts faces. Uh, uh, the frustrations, the, uh, it was either feast or famine as far as finances were current. The frustration of not being able to do everything that, that one would do perfectly, which is, I think the kids have prob will probably say this, and I would say it, uh, William Arthur Smith was a perfectionist uh, in his work in all areas. And this could be a little difficult, but I think, uh, I think we all understood and we tried to be as supportive through these times of frustration and uh, tried to uh, ease, uh, ease the tensions that would, that would certainly have to arrive. Uh, I think it was balanced by the great stimulation of of a the, of Bill's mind that that uh, the, these were the the good parts. So, uh, I mean, his mind was so active and so um, imaginative and and could grasp uh, a situation or a thought, to, and and then he could transfer it or make it known and communicate to those around him that everyone around him was stimulated. This is what made him an absolutely top-notch art instructor. I mean, his students to this day, I mean, think that, that Bill Smith was the best teacher, the best communicator uh, of, of art, you know, with the... Uh, they have learned more probably in six months about art and what art is about than any place else they may have been. They may have gone to every prestigious art school in, in the United States, and they still feel they learned so much. He could communicate uh, and, as I say, grasp uh, the uh, thought, an idea, and transfer it and communicate it. Uh, and it, uh, I will say that the um, uh, Bill and I were married just short of 40 years. Uh, and I will say at this point that the ups and downs, you know, uh, financially, uh, uh, mentally, whatever, frustrations, probably are certainly offset by the stimulation and the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the travels, the people that we knew. It was a continual source of, of, of interest to us and kept really kept us going a lot, particularly in the rough times. I don't know if that quite is, is clear to, uh, do I, com I don't know if I communicate what I feel generally about it, but I, I think they were probably, I was probably, I am a lucky person to have even had 39 and a half years with, with uh, someone like, um, like Bill. I really feel that way. But when I think about that, I think about breadth. I think about bigness. He, uh, he was a very big man. He uh, was interested in a lot of things. He knew a lot about a lot of things. He was self-educated and ferocious about learning. And 
he, I think he taught us all to go after it with that kind of vigor and uh, energy. And I think that one of the really valuable things about him was that he was able to bring so many cultural influences together into his own, into his own weave, as it were. And, and I think he taught us that we could kind of invent that way and not be stuck in a single discipline, drawing outside whatever our supposed focus was. And uh, he, he lived that. He, he was culturally bringing in influences from all over the world. It was a normal thing in our household to, to hear French, to hear Chinese, to be familiar with the names of Japanese artists and Polish artists, and to hear African music and Tibetan music. And uh, there, was, there was no limit to what was coming into this household in terms of input. Uh, so we could just kind of, it was like a smorgasbord, really. And I think if, if I have to point to one influence, it was that, that kind of breadth, that kind of variety, that kind of no limits setting. Great care and sensitivity, I think. And that applied to all things, whether it was something that he painted or in dealing with his family, um, dealing with his friends. Um, I think it was a quality that he had in humor course, great sense of humor. Uh, I think it applied to everything that he did. His basic qualities, um, painstaking, uh, painstaking care with uh, making a painting. Um, and a great uh, spiritual quality. And I think that following his own route, um, he did what he wanted to do, what, what he thought was the right thing to do. Uh, he, he did not get tempted by um, doing things that didn't come naturally to him. And that's, that's something that I respect more and more as I get older. I remember that an unusual thing was that he was always there because he worked in the house and it's I think a really unusual situation to have for a child to have both of their parents in the home at any one time and of course at that age I didn't realize that that was really special or unusual never having known anything else um, but I can remember any time during the day going in to him you know to his studio where he was working and he was always happy to have me come in and I could sit down on the floor with papers and pencils and whatever he had around for me to use and I would draw and we would draw together. He would be doing his painting or drawing and I would be on the floor with my paper um, making my drawings and you know that, that's one of my most vivid memories. I spent a lot of time as a child with him in his studio um, and I think that that opportunity for a child is is very unusual and really important and so I think it helped to really provide a basis for a close relationship um, and of course one also that we all had with my mother as well since she was home during the day. Um, it made for a very close family. He would tell us, <laughs> he would tell us how rich our experiences were. <laughs> He'd say I want you to pay attention to this, this is a very important person or we're driving through the French Alps now. I want you to wake up and notice this. Uh, now he would put, sort of point out sort of touch tones, uh, things that were extraordinarily magnificent. He would direct our attention to us and remind us this was an unusual experience. So he would help us sort of filter things, even when we were little kids. My earliest recollections of knowing Carl Sandburg was when I was probably one and a half, I think, and sitting on his lap in our apartment in New York City before we moved to Bucks County. Um, he was always like a grandfather to me, um, and uh, my father did um, illustrations for several of his books. Uh, my father's portrait of Carl Sandburg was uh, on the cover of, of a record of Carl Sandburg reading his own poetry, and that portrait is now in the National Portrait Gallery. 
I do remember, though, when I was um, six years old, ha being very um, interested in Japan at that stage. And um, what I really wanted to do was to go with my father to Japan, because at that point he was going to Japan a good bit. And um, unfortunately, he wasn't planning any travel in the next couple of years. At, you know, and I was I was just sort of thrilled with this at the time. And I remember for my sixth birthday, he took me into New York to the Kabuki restaurant, and we went into um, the tatami room and had this traditional Japanese meal. Uh, and that was very, very special. It was um, one of the best Chinese, or I'm sorry, one of the best Japanese restaurants in New York City at the time. And, and uh, he also presented me with a box of crepas, um, which are these oil crayons uh, that are used in Japan. They're, they're like oil pastels. And um, that had been another thing that I'd really wanted for my birthday. And it was this huge set with you know, 150 colors or 200 colors. And I remember that as being probably the best birthday in my life. Well, you know, he was meticulous. Um, maybe that was a, a strength and a fault at the same time for him. I know he struggled with, with it in letter writing, for instance. He would say, God, it takes me six days to write a letter, you know, because it has to be perfect. And, or if I'm writing a piece for some record jacket uh, or for some art magazine or something, I, I, I want to send the editor something that he just reads and says, okay, swell. He doesn't want the editor to, make, to find anything wrong with it. I mean, he's, he's self-educated, but I mean, if you look in his library, you find the elements of style, you find Fowler's familiar usage, and these are books that we all grew up with, too, because he didn't want to, he didn't, he didn't want anything he did to be less than perfect. So when he was doing research on a job, as I was telling you before, he would, he would know everything there was to know about that moment in history. Um, if he was doing a historical piece, and he did a lot of those, if he was doing uh, something about an animal, he would, he would do the same kind of research. Where would this animal be? What kind of time of year would it be? What, you know, all, all, of, all of its moves, basically. And he would just do the background to the teeth. And so he did a lot of research um, and was meticulous and very precise and took a lot of pride in that research. So he put a lot of, a lot of effort out that you would never see in the final. And he, he always taught us the thing that, he always taught us, you know, make it look easy, it, but it's not going to be easy. Um, he, he would always be on our case if he thought we were trying to cut corners or do something the easy way. Um, and he was just as hard on himself. My father wanted to uh, do a, sort of a stylish uh, illustration for this. It's a little bit different than some of his other illustrations, uh, a little bit less narrative. But to me, it has a feeling of uh, kind of breakfast at Tiffany's, in a sense. And he, he got a, a very, uh, one of the one of the uh, top models of the time to do the the uh, posing in this beautiful red dress. I remember seeing the red. I remember him bringing the red dress home for her to wear, and uh, my mother posed for uh, a couple of the people in the audience and uh, another friend by the name of Ken Nicholson, who was uh, who lived around Bucks County, lived in Bucks County during that time, and. Um, I think it's one of the most elegant illustrations that he did. Always patience. My father was never a person that seemed to be bothered by people um, watching him while he worked. He didn't appreciate having people raise a lot of commotion while he worked. And often when people unexpectedly came to the door, that was an intrusion on his time. But um, he never really minded having anyone watch him. And um, usually because uh, I would sort of sit there quietly and, and just you know, do my own thing while he did his. It was never a problem. In fact, I think he really liked that. There was, I, I mentioned this guy that day. His name is Jimmy Yancey. He was, he was actually the piano player at, uh, I think it was Comiskey Park in Chicago. And he also played in all the cat houses in Chicago. He was a blues pianist. 
Sometimes his wife would sing with him. He has some albums out. I mean, you can, you can actually get albums by this guy. And um, this was in the 30s. There was quite a blues scene in Chicago then, as there was all through the 60s and today, too. And uh, my dad played me these Yancey records, and, and there was a record in there called Death Letter Blues, which he always told me was one of the pieces of music he wanted played at his funeral. So, you know, there was, a, there was a lot of music in him, and when we had his funeral, he, he, always, he always loved Amazing Grace on the bagpipes, for instance. He always loved New Orleans marching music. When they, they had a funeral music, it would always be in a march. So those were big favorites of his, too. And so we had, we had Dixie Lanhorn players, and we had a bagpipe player. And I did my best to, to play the Yancey piece. One of the... One of the, the uh strongest memories, memories is, of course, how much he loved children. <laughs> and uh, in going back through the photographs that he took throughout our lives, some of which we hadn't seen in years, some of which we probably hadn't seen at all, it stood out how much he cared about us and how, how much he cared about his family, how much he cared about his animals, um, the dogs, the various dogs that we had growing up, um, how much he cared about his friends. Uh, he was he was a great documenter of uh, life in the house and and some very mundane activities sometimes and uh, we were very close because I I decided to go uh, more into the area that that he was I'm an artist myself and he was very encouraging and supportive to me there were a couple of times where I thought maybe I should become something else and he was also supportive of me in that respect too. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it was always a busy household. In fact, I always think of it as being like the United Nations, sort of here. Um, I remember one morning coming downstairs to the brother of the Dalai Lama uh, doing yoga on our rug. I think the biggest thing was a sense of trust, no matter how old we were, in our judgment at the time. You know, I, I, um, a lot of parents, I think, want to um, tell their children what they should think and how they should act and um, how they should conduct themselves. And he was not like that at all. He encouraged each of us to really think for ourselves and um, to, to think creatively and to cons not, not to necessarily follow someone else's solution for something, but to think of our own and to, be, to have the confidence to follow our own judgment. And having instilled that in us, I think he then trusted us with using that judgment. Um, I was allowed to go to Europe on my own when I was 14. And that's not something that many parents would let their daughter do. Um, 14 or 15 I was, and uh, I was traveling literally alone through Europe for part of that time. Um, he always had a lot of, of trust in how we dealt with things and our decisions, and I think that that is something that is very important to people, and especially as you have to go out on your own and make your own decisions and, you know, lead your life the way you're going to lead it. I think you have to have the confidence and, and be able to trust your own judgment and things. In a way, he was a parental figure to me as well as a friend. Um, he, he was an individual that was willing to give, as, as important as he was, he was willing to give of himself in a way that um, I, I mentioned he was transparent. Rather than being an important person, being tied up in that importance, he just moved right through that. It, it followed him. and. Um, the bond that the two of us had was a very close friendship. He could, he, if I ever needed any kind of thing, uh, help in, in a matter, I could come to him and ask his opinion of it. In, in the artwork, anytime, anything, and personal as well. And I would help him as well in business matters and things like that. Because uh, you can be very powerful in one domain of art, but very, maybe, uh, a beginner in another domain as well. 
and that was him in certain areas. Bill was the, an, an amazingly spontaneous person. Uh, it was not at all unusual in, in the course of a class that he would stop the class while the model was standing there and discuss a certain aspect of a figure of uh, how it relates to another artist's work, how it relates to something one of the students had done. And Bill would, in the midst of a class working very deliberately with the model, jump up, grab a book. It might be a published book. It might be a book of original works by another artist that he knew. It might be someone from Thailand or Moscow, or it might be someone from Mexico or Guadeloupe or anywhere around the world. And he would sit down and share a solution to a problem we were encountering. So you not only got the benefit of fellow classmates and of Bill Smith, but you got the benefit of someone who was very perceptive exploring with you how another artist worked to solve a particular problem. It was an invaluable resource. And I could picture Bill sitting there in his apron with his paints, eating fresh croissants and having a book on his lap explaining to a class the importance of an ear of a shoulder line, of the outline of a building, of the big spaces that we needed to look at. There is a whole litany of things that people in the class used to call Smithisms. Uh, things like the lightest light within a dark is darker than the darkest dark within the light. I hope I got it right. Things like look at the big picture, look at the simplicity of a line, explore the negative shapes. Uh, your values are out of sync. These were things that Bill constantly reinforced uh, through example, uh, time after time, to help us to see the simplicity of, of art, the simplicity of life. Um, and he would reinforce those things, and we carry them with us. I still carry them with me. And when, I, when I'm in trouble with the painting, that's where I turn to, get back to the simple values, the simple lines, a simplicity of technique. Um, being true to what you're painting, not painting from photographs, painting from life itself. That was the way Bill Smith painted himself, and that was what he wanted to share with the students, be part of life. I think that uh, his work is right up the top with anyone, and better, much better than most of them. Uh, the point is that sometimes, uh, Publicity makes a difference. And people that are associated in New York, that live in New York, I think have a bit of advantage over people in the country. But that doesn't uh, make for a good artist or, or not. I think the work itself will, will say it all. And I think that's the way it will be with Bill. You, you, no one will ever be able to take away what he's done and done so well. So yes, I think that he's going to remain and continue to grow. Artbeat is proud to give tribute to William Arthur Smith, who when asked to list the people he most admired, he replied, Most of the people whom I admire greatly are not at all well known. Some I have never met. Some lived many years ago. But I do know that inspiration and humility go together, and those I admire the most exemplify that. In my mind, William A. Smith is a man to be remembered and admired. Good night for Artbeat. I think, I think Bill's legacy is one of uh, caring about people and about art um, in a very serious way. Um, Bill was the type of guy that could tell you how a pigment was made and how permanent it was. He cared very deeply about the permanence of what he created. And I think that that permanence combined with his attitude towards art and his outreach to artists all over the world will only reinforce uh, the work that he's done.